Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast. I'm Stu Hardy, joined, as always, by Derek Brissett. Derek, it's been another exciting week of Major League Rugby. We've also had the return of the World 7 Series, this time in Singapore. Uh, how are you able to keep up with everything going on? Different time zones as well. Uh, yeah, no, it's hard. It's hard. Um, sleep, sleep's not a thing anymore. Uh, we're getting into that that part of the rugby season where there's just uh, there's you know leagues constantly. Like I mean, like what, how do you, you could spend a weekend. I think now, like if you woke up at like three a.m., you could watch like all the Super Rugby, kind of have that coast into like the Premiership, maybe some top fourteen the leagues in Europe, URC. And then you can start all the MOR games. And then some at some point you can put on the sevens during all of that, which is on all day. You uh you basically need like minimum six screens in your house right now. Yeah. Uh, none you of have them, like a stockbroker yeah. setup with or yeah. instead of, but instead of uh, tracking markets, you're tracking rugby. Yeah, instead. just rugby games or whatever. Maybe you have an extra one so you can watch like the new episode of Moon Knight or something as well. <laughs> but if you can manage to carve out the time for that. But yeah, you got to do something during halftime. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there we go. Watch Moon Knight during halftime. It's uh, it's uh, you know that that show takes place in London though, so maybe uh, maybe we'll get a rugby scene later on in the uh, in, in the show. We need to up the Marvel rugby references. There's only been a uh, it's only been one, I think, at best. Yeah, no. And, Purple Man is watching a rugby game in uh the uh the Jessica Jones. Uh, we don't even know if they're canon anymore into the whole MCU. They but, totally uh, are. They totally yeah. are. They t- you're not caught up if you don't think they're canon in the MCU anymore. I'll just say that. But there's a know. Jessica Jones episode called Red Card, which is a Red Card, no Sinbin, Red Card or Sinbin, something like that, which is a, another obvious rugby reference. And yeah. yeah, Purple Man's like watching a rugby game. Yeah, um, I actually I actually know which rugby game he's watching. It's watching the Six Nations, and it's England versus France. Oh and wow! This which is deep? Which is very interesting because Purple Man is played by David Tennant, who is notably Scottish. So <laughs> I don't know if he's supporting. He must be supporting France in that scenario because I don't think no matter how much they give you in money, there's not enough money for a Scotsman to support England in any sense. What's his line though? It's something about like, is it, so like is, oh, that's an obvious red card. It's an obvious like red card. But there's he also says something about like a terrible like box kick decision. Yeah. Um, okay. Well. I think we're getting yeah. off topic. No, we're we're not. We need to take. We podcast, absolutely are. No, this Come podcast on. needs to become a deep dive on Marvel rugby references. Shout out yeah, to Agent, all one of them. Yeah. Oh no, two. Shout out to Agent Venom in one random comic where he mentions that he has to go coach a rugby game as a reason why he can't do something for somebody else because a rugby we, game occupies that so agent venom and purple man the two confirmed rugby fans in the marvel universe hopefully more to come now normally when we talk about games of the weekend sometimes we start off with the second game sometimes it's the last game uh, but the mlr were very gracious enough to have the arrows be the first game of the weekend so we will actually talk about the first match of round 10 which was the Toronto Arrows versus Old Glory DC. Yeah, it was a strange old game. I thought we were really good ball in hand and, and we certainly jumped out to a, to a decent lead there in that second half. Um, on attack, we were able to build phases, play quick, play to the edges and, and we scored some really good tries and uh, played some really entertaining rugby. Unfortunately, just discipline or a real discipline let them in the game. We gave away far too many penalties, far too many offside penalties, allowed them to get in our half and, and they were just take, able to take advantage of it. Um, the cards did hurt us a, a little bit. It's always tough towards the end of the game playing with 14 men and then down to 13 men at, at the end there but I mean credit to our team they, they, they fight for each other they, they fight in front of their home fans and uh, we really dug deep at the end there and we were able to come away, uh, come away with the win So going into this game Old Glory DC you know still winless this season but have uh, changes within the coaching staff. Uh, Nate Osborne, this was the first game that he's now officially led as the interim head coach for Old Glory and, you know, this is a very different old glory than the one we saw back in the third week, uh, round three, Whatever I believe. Week, yeah, it was the first, uh, yeah. the first W of the year. Yeah, it's uh, far closer to last week and round nine than 
anything earlier this season. So it seems as though the coaching chains are having a positive effect at the moment. And, you know, uh, DC were coming close to maybe causing the upset, getting their first win of the season. Um, however, I think there were the main thing that let them down was their kicking because they scored five tries. Um, now, to be honest, uh, Toronto only got uh, two out of three conversions, but DC only scored one out of five. And on top of that, they had no penalties as well. Well, Toronto, Toronto had two out of three conversions plus a seven-point try. Yes, that is true. So, yeah. but, but that's the thing. Is that if you don't have to kick it, then it doesn't count towards kicks. But <laughs> but in the sense that's still a far that's like sixty six percent as opposed to twenty percent of kickable conversions. DC actually outscored Toronto in tries uh, five to four, <laughs> and yet they just weren't able because if you imagine if they had scored all their conversions, that's an extra eight points, and that would have given them the win comfortably. So it's a big it's one if, of these things that, and, <laughs> that's a well, big if. Yeah, well, they didn't, so it's not really much yeah. an if scenario. But yeah, these are the things that are going to be uh, things that, you know, Nate Osborne is saying, like, look, we need to reel these in. And, you know, Peter Smith has said that the arrows in discipline is something that was costing them, especially in the last 10 minutes of yeah. the game, you know, uh, letting their foot off when they should have really been uh, holding the fort, you know. Bad tackle from uh, Sheridan, got him yellow carded. Repeat infringements, got uh, Shepard yellow carded as well. And, you know, the Arrows are still with a long list of uh, injuries and such, as well as the hiring of two new scrum halves. Well, I say new. Uh, one of them is a firm favourite within the uh, original Arrows of uh, 2019. And the other one is a... Canadian capped international scrum half. So, you know, guys that can easily fit within the system. And, you know, I think obviously, like guys you're going to mention, uh, McCann getting his first try for the hours, McRogers getting another one, Keith getting his second in the season, and Voralek getting that uh, seven point try at the start of the second half to secure the try bonus point for the hours. So there, there was a lot of positives. It was just the uh, final quarter, I'd say, that is uh, a bit concerning. But, you know, if they get their heads down, focus on discipline, realise that they'll be playing DC again later this season and DC will be looking to capitalise on all discipline more so then, that as long as they can keep it under wraps, then, you know, should get the... Uh, Full four, four and zero oh against uh, DC, including the post, and including the postseason, including the preseason as well in twenty twenty two. This game was obviously, as you kind of mentioned going into it, um, the biggest one of the biggest questions coming into this game was just sort of the arrows injury situation, with you know all the scrum halves being injured. As you said, they they uh, they brought in Denardo and McCrory. Um, very interesting circumstances for both, as they said. Uh, Denardo, I think, got it, got in, uh, got showed up on Thursday, got a practice in. Um, McRory was only there for the captain's run. He just kind of, and uh, I mean, he played a good chunk of the second half too. He just kind of got thrown in there. Probably super helpful bringing in a guy like Denardo who has already played for the team, so probably knows the system a little bit. Um, even if it's you know, even if that system gets tweaked over time, but um, uh, talked to Denardo after the game. And basically, he said, I've been teaching preschool in Poland. I've been in Warsaw, which has been a lot of fun. Playing a little bit of club rugby out there. And uh, I've been following the boys and kind of chatting with my dad. And when I guess a couple of the injuries started coming in, we were joking about getting a call or not. And then, then it started happening. And I got a text from Winnie after the game last weekend. And it's like, hey, can you come out and play? And I obviously want to come help, help the boys out and, and come back and play some good rugby. You know, like he was in Poland, like teaching in Poland when he got like following the arrow season teaching in Poland and then, you know, ended up coming over 
during this week, um, which is just a wild story. Real life. like uh, the arrows had him hop on, hop on a plane, and he got over here on time to uh, to play this game, and actually and played like really well too for his first MLR game in in a in a bit, and then obviously probably not thinking, you know, even two to three weeks ago that he would be playing for the Toronto Arrows and against Old Glory DC in this game. And then, you know, good on McRory too coming over um, pretty fresh. I guess he only got the captain's run in. So uh, see kind of, we'll see how it ends, uh, ends up kind of shaking out. Obviously um, it'd be nice to get guys like Brody back. Um, but, but you know, it's, it's going to uh, that, you know, there's, they're still out and uh, Donardo and McRory are so, you know, if you're, if you're down to your, uh, your fifth and sixth string scrum halves. Um, there's, there's probably uh, there's no, no better option than uh, Riley Denardo and Gordon McCrory for uh, any other team in the league right now. So, um, yeah. so and, and they played well too. I think yeah. So like getting into the game itself, obviously, um, you know, Peter Smith mentioned in his post game interview too that he was, you know, the the arrows played you know a pretty expansive attacking brand of rugby in this game mm-hmm. um, that worked. You know, they they were able to kind of attack Old Glory through the middle a little bit. There were some huge line breaks. Guys like Shepard got a pretty Shepard got a pretty big line break. Foley got a pretty big line break. Obviously, um, McCann's try to start the game uh, that was a huge break from Richardson that Vorlek followed up. Vorlek had a nasty offload uh, to McCann for that try, and uh, Vorlek, man, probably the most impressive player for the Arrows yeah. in this game. Um, his first MLR star. And I think this is what comes watching Mitch, Mitch Vorlek in this game, I think is what comes back to. It's like when we talk about how deep the Toronto arrows are and how, you know, I'm not sure, like given an injury situation that the arrows have, how many other teams in the league would be able to handle it as well as they've had through the first nine games of the season. Uh, but like the depth of the arrows really, I think really shines through when you watch a guy like Vorlek come into this game you know, first MLR start. He was playing for the academy team a couple weeks ago. Um, he's yeah. got a couple MLR games under his belt coming off the bench. And, you know, starts this game, has a massive play within the first 10 minutes, um, picking up an unreal try assist for McCann. Like, even, like, Richardson's pass to him was probably a little in front of Vorlek too, and he made that great play to reach out with one hand. Uh, yeah. reach out with one hand, snag the ball, reel it in, keep the play going, and uh, then it's just a nasty one-handed offload for uh, for McCann to finish. Uh, you know, later in the game too, um, Sam Malcolm, aka the best player in Major League Rugby, you know, with a nasty little grubber kick through that, not even with advantage. They didn't, the arrows didn't even have advantage on that. Malcolm's just like, this is on, and we're gonna do it. Um, Vorlek runs on to it doesn't even have to break stride it's a perfect kick and uh, you know so that's a that was a great try too it's not even just like the tries that he scored too obviously he, you know he had a ton of carry meters in the game he was making tackles some like really impactful tackles too a g- really strong defensive game as well so uh, yeah he did a great job to cover like Rohan Saifoloi, uh sent a kick kind of that you know, found some, uh, found the grass, uh, deep in arrows territory. He did a good job to kind of just come over and cover, you know, cover it and, uh, you know, ensure the arrows retain possession to kind of, uh, to clear, but, you know, overall, just a phenomenal game from Mitch Vorlek. I know, uh, I know Ronan Foley got the, the broadcast man, man of the match. Um, he played great as well, but if it was up to me, I think I would have gone with Vorlek in this one. Um, just for, you know, unreal try set up on unreal try later in the game too. tons of carry meters, you know, played well defensively, uh, just thought an absolutely outstanding game for him. And, you know, a big reason why we talk about the arrows depth is guys like Vorlek able to step up and be one of one of, if not the best player on the pitch in, in a game that the, the arrows needed to win as well. Right. So it's a massive performance from him. Uh, anybody else stand out to you in this game here, Stu? Well, I'm actually going to agree with you. I think Mitch Volek did basically everything he could to get the Man of the Match award. It was just that uh, Ron Foley also had an amazing game as well. Yeah, yeah and that's, it's not that Foley didn't have an amazing game. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, yeah, it's uh, Foley it, it's was just a, Yeah, it's just that when you have so many players playing like so well, 
yeah. you obviously have to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It's his first then... start, too. That's that'd be. I cool. know that's the yeah. impressive thing as well. Um, uh, I also thought McCann had a great start, and also mm-hmm. uh, for like obviously assisting in that in uh, McCann's try as well. It's great to see. Um, to be honest, all the backs had a phenomenal get shit ridden. This was probably, I mean, probably as evidenced by the fact that they got the bonus point try and the first game that they scored 30 points is probably collectively, probably the backs, at yeah. least from an attack standpoint, the backs best game of the year. Yeah, I think from the four, attack, it's, yeah. especially for the first half of the season, I've had to, you know, with all the injuries that have come through, um, it's been a clear focus on, you know, forwards, driving more set pieces, things like that in order to score tries. And also, um, especially shown with like the game against New York, it's been the case of, uh, you know, taking the opportune moment and just having the power to basically get over the try line. Yeah. Um, this game scene, this was, uh, with the exception of Malcolm and an entirely Canadian uh, back selection, um, the toy and Richardson had great starts at centers. Um, Richardson, I think, did a phenomenal job as well. Yeah, Rich- Richardson was good. Obviously, he had the uh, we keep bringing up that first try of the game because it was it was so nice, but uh, yeah, Richardson was the guy that started that too. Yeah, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that, like, um, when you look at like the front row, uh, Keith McRogers Roland. Uh, two of those guys you normally have on the bench. And, I mean, the, f- the front row on the bench was phenomenal. Quatrin, <laughs> Flavor, Salmon. You know, you're not going to turn your nose up at that, but also... The, be- yeah, the bench was pretty uh, good in this game. Also, so. like, yeah, the back row, Bailey, Foley, O'Neal. Who's on the bench for them? Rumble. Yeah, yeah, some and Rumble. And not. Yeah, pretty good. So, you know, um, and obviously you have uh, Spencer Jones and Will Kelly... And McCrory, again, backs options are incredibly limited at the moment. So, of course, they're going to be. Yeah, there's the, uh, like we said last week, is like that's McRory, obviously the new scrum half, and then Jones and Kelly, the uh, the two remaining healthy backs. Yeah. So. Yeah, in fact, the only players that you can imagine being in like the same structure is Shepard and Cellini, both it's... starting as locks. Yeah. And again, and with the exception, uh, Cellini obviously going the entire 80, Shepard 78 minutes. But, uh, well, Shepard wouldn't have come off, he came off because he got the yellow. I, I know, as in that's what I mean, as in he could only get to the 78 minute mark before uh, that yellow card denied him the full 80. Yeah. And, but you know, as in, you know, you're talking about depth, this is what you want to have. You want to have a front row that can. No, still tussle up front, and then you have what you would normally classify as, you know, the starters being on the bench, able to come on, able to put the effort in to secure the win, especially at the end where it was uh, especially needed in that final scrum. Yeah, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, as soon as yeah, when Foley came off and O'Neill came off, uh, Rumble and Not, I think they would. I think everyone did exceptionally well. The starters, obviously, all. And uh, more time to flex their stuff. They're fortunate that there doesn't seem to have been any injuries as well compared to the game against um, Atlanta. <laughs> and and, when we, and uh, speaking against the game at Atlanta, we now have a full um, fitness update and health update. Do you guys have any like update on the injury situation? Is there uh, anybody that you're look, kind of looking forward to maybe possibly coming back within the next week or so? Yeah. Um, so we should have uh, we should have a few guys coming back sort of within the next two three weeks. We're, we're able to get Spencer Jones back this week and he finished the game for us and, and finished really strong. Uh, hopefully Matt Moore should be available next week. Um, we've got who else we have? We've got uh, we've got Gaston Mirrors, Tommy De La Vega, not too far away. Um, so we should get most of us quite back at the business end of the season. But we've had a horror run with uh, injuries, haven't we? But it, it's given opportunities to some other guys and they've played outstanding. Um, you know, we've been in the hunt, we've been thereabouts, and, yeah. or there or thereabouts, and it's crazy to think we've got 14, 15 guys out and still able to put in some really, really good performances. So yeah, 14 names on the injury list. No one's currently listed as day to day, which is the 
most concerning factor. But of course, uh, Peter Smith has said he's hoping to get players back mm -hmm. uh, within the next couple of weeks. So hopefully we can see a reinforced um, Arrows squad. Yeah, he sounded and most optimistic about Matt Hood in that uh, in that clip there. Yeah, because I, re I remember Matt Hood was penciled in to play Utah and then got injured, got injured at, in, warm in the captain's yeah. run or the warm-up. And uh, yeah. yeah, it was just back week to week from that point on. Yeah. So, like, going through this game, too, I mean, trying to talk about some of the changes from, like, Atlanta, too. Like, I thought, like, the scrum in general was a lot better. Yeah. Um, oh, goodness, yes. Yeah. It, yeah, it was a lot better, even with – you know, even with like as you kind of mentioned, like uh Quatron and Salmon started the game on the bench. Um, so you had uh Keith McRogers and Roland to start. And uh yeah, like the scr the scrum was significantly better. They were able to, you know, get a get a penalty or two, but also just you know, create a good platform for the backs to attack off of. Um, similarly to like the mall looked pretty good in this game. They obviously scored two tries off of that mall, uh, both the McRogers and the Keith. Mall were there. Um, they gave up, I guess. Consequently, too, they gave up a couple of tries through the mall as well. Um, but at the end of the game, when it kind of mattered most, they were able to shut down, you know, despite being down to 13 men, um, set only seven forwards with Shepard, who Mike Shepard's probably one of the best players on the arrows at defending the mall. And, um, you know, they were without him for the final, for that final mall, uh, for, uh, you know, toward the end of the game there, they were able to shut that down. I think it was, it looked kind of, to me, it looked like Rumball was the guy that kind of got through. Um, but you know, it's also one of those pile of body situations, but, it, um, looked like Rumball kind of came away with the ball there. So that was huge. And then obviously again, the scrum did well to, you know, set a little bit of a platform, allowed Rumball to to come off and McRory to uh, kick the ball into touch to seal the win. Um, so definitely got to be kind of happy with a bit of the, uh, you know, set piece improvement during, during this game too. Um, and, you know, as, as Peter Smith said too, like the attack looked really good, um, you know, especially like, I like, you know, the, the best part of like the Mount that uh, Vorlek try is just like the confidence uh, in Malcolm, the creativity, just, in general to do it. I know Vorlek mentioned that like Malcolm kind of called for it. Um, so the ability to kind of like see that the, that's open, have the confidence to do it. Um, there was a lot of guys making some pretty slick offloads in this game too. Um, so mm -hmm. like the attack was constantly, was constantly flowing, you know, it, it, overall, like just, you, you know, the attacking structure was, was working, was working out like really well in this game. Um, they were able to kind of, you know, run through some phases, break down the old glory defense, uh, you know, get a couple penalties that they were able to turn into points. Um, the first one obviously is really nice because it just happens really quickly. Uh, you get up to a three nothing lead three minutes into the game. That's always a positive thing to have happen. Um, right. So, you know, definitely plenty of positives to kind of say from that. The uh, the glaring negative of the game, though, is obviously just um the final, I would say the, the final 20 minutes. Uh, and it really just yeah. kind of came down to, to discipline. Right. And, you know, the arrows started taking a lot of penalties, um, a lot of penalties kind of back to back and, you know, old glory started running in some tries, um, yeah. which is, which is just, which is tough. And obviously there was, um, so Corey Daniels second try to, which, didn't really help at all, um, which was uh, that was a really, you know, it was a great. It looked like a it's a great line break um, from uh, Sifaloy, and then you know he finds Daniel. Daniel kind of finishes the try. You know the arrows immediately want that looked at um, the, from the TMO perspective, mm -hmm. and it um, it a hundred percent is obstruction. Yeah, that's uh, a hundred percent obstruction. If you go back and like rewatch, like Jake Jake Il Nicky is essentially holding Kyle Bailey. Yeah, like a full out like like even if you were even if you were allowed to like even like football, you're allowed to block. What yeah. Jake Il Nicky is doing is a penalty in football. Yeah, like it's like it's not even like it's a good block. It's still a like it's it's a penalty in football. Um. So he's, he kind of holds him back, which creates the gap. Um, Sheridan ends up hitting Sifaloy, who credit to Sifaloy, take a hit to make a play. 
you'll yeah. you always you gotta always love players that do that. But I I don't know what did you think of that yellow card on Sheridan because this is kind of a double. It was kind of a, a bit of a double whammy for the arrows on this one. The obstruction doesn't get called, and then Sheridan gets a yellow card. Um, yeah, it's in the definitely... process of the review when they when uh, looked like the officiating staff saw the hit as they were kind of reviewing it because it wasn't originally asked for to look for a foul play. Yeah. They were just looking at that obstruction. And would you kind? Of, what did you think? Because I, 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 th- I think it's a very borderline call because you can see um, yeah. as. Uh, Sheridan's going for, in for a tackle. Uh, Cyphaloid's also going down as well. And then it's just the collision contact point is, you know, I'd still say around about here. So, you know, That's top of the not, chest kind of area. Even, not, the, the TMO review worded it as shoulder to chest. Yeah. So like that's... So, yeah, so which isn't high. a yellow card. It yeah, wasn't so, high. I guess they thought he didn't wrap, but I mean, I don't know. It looks yeah, like I, he, I think it looks it, like he tried. There was an attempt to, to wrap at least. So I think yeah. it's it is a very like air on the side of caution. Maybe it's something that um, you know, yeah. the MLR referees have been told, you know, if it's above this area and anything to do with like the neck yeah. and head or anything close to that area, you know, just keep your eye on it. And But it's not the neck and head. Down. They literally... I, I know, I know. That's the thing. It's like over, <laughs> being overzealous yeah, in that absolutely. area. Um, so, yeah, I think that was a... Um, yeah, it's a double whammy of disappointment one. because it... Yeah, that was a tough was all, one. It all seemed okay. And then to be told that not only does the try get to stand because we're not looking at the right thing it's also this other thing that didn't affect the try in any way shape or form yeah i guess uh, flagged well, as a yeah i mean i got, got some tweets from like old glory fans mentioning uh pointing out some calls that they felt went against them and, yeah um and then you knew what that's fair enough or whatever this is what this is what fan bases do but as what yeah. fan bases do I'll also point out that yeah. calls went against us too guys yeah so it's a uh, like you know it's it is what it is or whatever um you know a couple you know, forward pass here and there that maybe went called, but it's, uh, and then, yeah, like, I don't know. I guess it is what it is. I like, I, I, I'm more upset about the, the obstruction call than the, than Sheridan's yellow card. But the fact that both of them are on the same play is just brutal. Um, yeah. But beyond that, though, like the other, the, like what leads to the, uh, the Shepherd yellow card is just like, in all honesty, how many penalties are you going to take? In yeah. The last five yeah. The game. Like, yeah. Well, I, it's it's, it's uh, it was, according to the stats on the MLR website is that the arrows yeah. conceded fifteen penalties. Yeah, in wild. this game, yeah. which is most of them were probably in the last many. like thirty minutes of the game. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a problem. It was like we can't say like oh, in which quarter or which half was how many penalties. Oh, but like, yeah, like yeah, but, just, yeah. How I mean, many? Like, because there was like two or three like side entry in the mall calls. Um, yeah. Like at the end of the game too, and it was it was just it is, and it was like you know even as we mentioned like after the game, like it was one of you know I, I like I asked Peter Smith like what he's like what the team's gonna focus on like during training this week, and like discipline was like the first thing, right? Because it's yeah. I quite frankly you let old glory back into the game, yeah, be- because of it, right? You know, and and yeah, and you know at least you know the positive thing though is like. The, the arrows defense which we mentioned last week is is actually really good yeah. um and you know fortunately despite the two yellow cards the defense came up big when it mattered the most and were able to you know keep old glory out of the uh, you know out of the uh, the try area and you know seal the win but perhaps a little too it's one of those games that it's like, I feel like it's great for the fans, but perhaps a little too exciting for the coaching staff. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, well, I, I don't know. I was sitting in the crowd and I wasn't feeling very great about, until, up until like the 79th minute. Peter Smith did also mention um, probably finishing tries um, because, you know, as we kind of mentioned, right? Like you, you looked at, you know, old glory and being like, well, they, they missed a lot of conversions. Yeah. Right. Um, Dabalus, uh was 0 for 2. Siphaloy was 1 for 3. At right. Which is that's a lot of points left on the board. Yeah. Um, but like even for the, the arrows, the arrows got down like within five meters a couple of times. And there was like, you know, a knock on or 
um, you know, some sort of handling error that, you know, would end, would end that scoring opportunity. Uh, you know, like th- that happened on a, you know, on a couple of occasions during the game. Right. And, you know, that's something too. Right. So, you know, good, well, I mean, good on old glory for shutting the, shutting the try scoring opportunities down, but, but, you know, that's, uh, you know, th- that is something that we've kind of talked about. Um, so obviously like the arrows are probably going to be in a position right now where they're going to need to be picking up some try bonus points. Um, so yeah, like- uh, Brody on the MLR, I believe is the MLR kickoff podcast, was saying that the goal now is basically what they did in 2019, which is from now to the bonus end of the season, they need to get yeah. bonus point wins. Yeah, exactly. I feel right like, I, I mean, I know, I know they went for a penalty. Uh, they opted for the post three minutes into this game, but I feel like much like that 2019 season, it's like I don't even think they're going to th- think about it until there's four tries on the board. Um, D, you know, DC got a bon- got a bonus point, two bonus points in this game. So that's probably mm-hmm. is that their best outcome? Have they got? Oh no, have they got? They got two point bonus points against New York last week, right? Yeah, so they are currently on yeah. five table points. You know, you know, I mean, I think I think I'll, I'll say like, um, it does honestly like watching watching Old Glory in this game though, and I mean, I know like they're zero and nine, and it's like I know that for that. F- fan base like watching the team go 0 and 9 you're seeing you know coaches getting fired um you know new coaches being brought in uh at the halfway mark of the season like th- watching the old glory play this game especially it's like they they had some good opportunities and stuff too uh palamo is a beast um and well that his name is literally threat threat so. yeah threatened yeah it's it's a cool name. Um, but uh, yeah, like he's a beast, man. And like some of the carries that he was making, just, you know, dragging defenders with them. Um, I thought like, you know, South played well. I thought South played well. Nicali played pretty, uh, pretty well as, uh, in this game too. Um, we'll give a shout out to Luke Campbell as well. Um, just because, mm-hmm. you know, Canadian. Uh, and like they, um, like the team looks like they're not going to, I don't think they're going to go 0 and 16. No, like, they're going to get a win. Yeah. And you can kind of, I think you can kind of sense that in this game because they, they had, and like, quite frankly, they had an opportunity to win this game. They didn't, yeah. they didn't do it. They had an opportunity to do it. What, like you said, whether that's through just like, Hey, make a kick. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, they, uh, they were obviously struggling with that, but it's also, you, they were, they had a line out five meters out at the end of the game against 13 men. And they, didn't score on it yeah right like that's a big opportunity to score but like you know if you're going to take a pot like like it's they can they're going to win a game this they're, year. They're, they're not going to it's they're not going to be the austin elite well they are playing dallas i believe in two weeks time but yeah. uh they've got a game against utah next week yeah. and if you want to talk about coaching changes well yeah. Utah, Utah have obviously been able to get some wins this season, mm-hmm. but you know they've been in a bit of a rut at the moment. They'll be coming off a bye week this week. I think if DC is not going to go zero and sixteen, mm-hmm. that they'll probably I can see them getting a few wins this season, and I can see the first one coming up against Utah. Yeah, that's Utah's next week, right? Uh, I think yeah. they go Utah, Dallas. Is that their next two? Yes. Games? So it may the be that they games. get uh, runner games going. Yeah. And, you know, finally I'm, get some I'm... momentum in there behind them, get some wind in their sails. Yeah. The best, the best thing that can happen right now, from our point of view, is that they beat New York or Atlanta. Just a shock, upset yeah. game. That'd be huge. That's I would love to see that so much. Yeah. I think like even like right now, like kind of looking at the standings. So as we're kind of t- leaning into this, talking about the standings, talking about the arrows, picking up bonus points. Shout out to the LA Guiltinis doing, yeah. doing, doing the doing, boys, doing absolute the solid. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get to this game yeah. in a bit, but, but that's uh, but that's that's huge though, right? Because yeah, well, as in it's for, a bye week now for I think for, three of the Eastern teams. It's a bye week for Atlanta, New York, and New England. Yeah, so the top the of the table teams. is yeah, like all, of all taking a pause. And Toronto's playing NOLA this week. 
So yeah. you have so for one, if you're the Toronto Arrows, you can't lose to Old Glory and Nola. You can't lose to the teams that are below you in the standings. Mm-hmm. Right? That can't happen now. Yeah. Um, so you get an opportunity against Atlanta, but the, the key thing is though, so going back to that, uh, and we'll we'll talk more in depth on the uh the LA New York game, but the like the gist of it really is that LA won 43 to nothing, yeah. which not which brings the arrows to within five points of New York for the final playoff spot in the East now. But the other thing is that by, because LA won 43, nothing, right. They dropped New York's point differential from 49 to six. Yeah. Right. So now if the arrows are probably looking at, if you win by 10 against Nola, right. Like you're, you're looking at a playoff spot when we're recording, you're looking at a playoff spot when we're recording next, next Monday. Yeah. Right. So it's, um, that's obviously a huge opportunity, but even further than that, right. If you want to go with like, I guess a bit of opportunity here, if I recall the schedule correctly. So coming out of that bye week, New York and new England play each other. Wow. Right. So that's another, that's a loss for somebody. Yeah. Right. Toronto plays Houston. The week after, so they got Nola Houston, and then the next week is going to be the Arrows bye week, which in which Atlanta's going to play LA, New York's going to play Nola, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but then the Arrows are going to come out of their bye week and they get New York, Dallas, New England, Atlanta, and Old Glory to end the season, yeah, right? So it's a if, mixed bag to say. Yeah, but but that's the thing. But that's exactly what you would want, though, right? So yeah. you're gonna get in, in each of the weeks, you're gonna get the games here where like New York still has to play Atlanta later on. Um, right. The last game of the season, week 18, New York plays New England again. Right. So it's like you're gonna get the teams that are in the top three are going to start taking points away from each other. Yeah. They like they have to. They're gonna to have to somebody wins, somebody loses, yeah. right? Or even if it's a draw, you're taking points away from each other, anyways, mm-hmm. right? And basically, like you kind of look at the last, you know, the last seven games of the season, and it's like you are the arrows are still in a position where it's like they have complete control over their own destiny here. Yeah. Like you show, as you kind of said, like I guess you know to borrow the term, like kind of run the table. You can obviously run the table, but like you get opportunities to to beat New York again, to beat New England again, to beat Atlanta, to move up a, move up the table on your own, right? So, yeah. Um, still in a good – so, I mean, still in a good spot, just five points out halfway through the season. And like we said, it's like um, the next couple of games, I mean, all three teams at the top of the table have their bye week, but then, you know, coming out of the next week, right, they start – the three teams at the top of the table start playing each other a lot yeah. more often. Um, so that's going to kind of shake up what the standings look like. And, yeah. but yeah, man, I think, I think the, uh, the arrows, I think the arrows are still in good shape. I think they keep playing like the, like this, they'll be, all, um, like they're going to be all right. I want to hopefully going into NOLA next week. Um, the scrum, uh, continues to improve. Um, uh, I thought as in addition to the scrum, the lineup looked was pristine. This game too, it was solid. Um, and, um, you know, they're starting to steal a little bit more line out balls and stuff like that too. Uh, but like, I think you kind of take that, you keep playing this expansive attacking rugby, you get some of these players back for the business end of the season. Uh, I think there's reason to be optimistic. Um, if you're an arrows fan that, you know, only being a, only being five points out nine, nine games into the season. Um, like it's probably a good spot to be in most of the games still at home. Right. So, yeah. Um, it uh it should be good it should be good man it'll uh yeah. hopefully we get some guys back um as it keeps going and the team uh team seems like they're getting they're getting better week in week yeah. out right which is really all you kind of want um any but um yeah i don't anything else you want to touch on from this game yeah i think there's a lot of things to work on as I mentioned discipline and yeah. um you know just control and making sure that uh, retaining ball possession, not making any, you know, silly 
mistakes or any easily missed tackles, which has been an issue for the Arrows across the season, not just uh, recently. And yeah, you know, like they are in a position where, yeah, bonus point wins is uh, what we need. But yeah, we are now officially in the business end of the MLR regular season. And so far, business is looking good for Toronto. Um, how much of you guys bad have been enjoying playing back oh, back home in Toronto, getting the first win on home soil in uh, since, yeah. well, since 2019, <laughs> since that drop goal game? I yeah, guess. Yeah, it's been it's been a crazy, I guess, thousand days, three years of just feel like you've been on the road the entire time. It's uh, quite a feat, and uh, I guess a bit surreal, I'd say. Uh, still being here it's it's you know wonderful hearing people cheer for you rather than always having someone else uh, someone else cheer against you so uh, I mean hopefully we can make this place a fortress like we made Lamport back in 2019 and, and uh, you know it's just great really great getting that support from uh, from all the fans friends family everybody again it really means a lot and uh, we all appreciate you on the team thank you very much all right so we've talked about the most important game of the uh, round 10 but you know that wasn't the only one uh we now move a bit further uh, south from toronto into new england who hosted seattle and you know this was a impressive performance by the sea wolves because it looked at the start um i managed to catch like the opening um quarter of this game and it looked to be like standard new england fashion they were scoring tries, no one able to stop them, regardless of the weather, everything was going their way. But in the second half, Seattle were able to turn it around to get their scores coming in. And unfortunately, the clock just ran out before they were able to get the job done, unfortunately. Um, this was also uh, for Seattle, Travis Larson's first start of the season, you know, up against uh, brother Josh Larson. And, uh, yeah, you know, it was a very encouraging performance from Seattle who, you know, well, I mean, every team's now trying to get the bonus point win to get <laughs> yeah. them through to the playoffs. So, uh, but, you know, if you were a Arrows fan and you were worried about like the last 10 minutes or the last five minutes or so from the Arrows game, just imagine being a New England fan with the scores being only two point difference at the end you know I, I think a lot of us will need to invest in uh, heart medication by the time we get to <laughs> round 18 yeah well i mean yes yes and no i mean obviously that's good man like you want uh you know this was a um i was actually about this like this was another like it was a good week of games you got the first two um were super close um the like Austin San Diego was a pretty close game too until San Diego or until Austin pulled away. LA versus New York was close until LA got off the bus. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but beyond that, like, I mean, close games are obviously good. You would rather you, I mean, that's, that's the thing that sells tickets and stuff, right? It's yeah. like the, the excitement. Um, I don't like eh, for this game though, like the, the new England Seattle game to one, it's super cool seeing uh, Josh and uh, Travis Larson battle head to head. And that's, that's fun. I guess Josh gets the, uh, the bragging rights at the, uh, you know, if the, the family's getting together for Easter dinner yeah. or something next week, I guess he's got yeah. the, uh, the bragging rights, but. Not, um, well, well, actually, uh, well, Seattle will be uh, playing this coming weekend, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, um, New, well, New England have the bye week, Seattle don't. So uh, Travis will have to be joining through uh, Zoom or something to uh, <laughs> get in that Yeah, way. exactly. But either way, he's still got the bragging rights. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like, I mean, you know, well, I think like Bodin Waka had a penalty in the 75th minute that kind of put the game out of reach. I know, uh, like, I know C Seattle scored two tries in the last 10 minutes, but it was like just the, the gap that New England kind of built up. And that that penalty from Waka at the end of the game just kind of made it like it, it put it out of reach or whatever. Good on Turner, though, for. And good on Turner in Seattle in general for just kind of you know to keep on battling and they get that uh that losing bonus point at least right so um, that helps them out because the West is uh, the West is also super tight as far as playoff races go right now so um, you know we're talking about the arrows kind of needing uh needing all the points that they can get and going for bonus points and the uh, the West is pretty much the same thing man like it's uh 
it, it's pretty tight between uh like Austin's a little bit ahead with 33 points, but then you got like LA, San Diego, Houston, Seattle. The gap is 29 to 22 between all four of those teams. So yeah. Um, you know, that's a they they need Seattle needs a bonus points too, as does probably pretty much everybody in the West, because it's uh this is gonna be a tight one out there. Absolutely. Okay, and then the third game, uh, the first of the two games that were being held on at the same time, uh, was NOLA versus ATL. This is also the return of Matt Heaton from injury straight into the starting 15. And again, this seemed to be one of those games where ATL pulled ahead after NOLA got the opening score. You know, um, ATL scored three tries in the first half to NOLA's two. And then um, Noel scored their third try in the 54th minute. And then five minutes later, it was De La Vega Mendia who secured the try bonus point. And then um, Coleman in the 73rd minute just to, you know, round things off. And uh, we were all done there. Final score, Nola 17, ATL 34. And this marks, I believe, the Rattlers fourth consecutive victory over nola gold so yeah but that's the thing it's gonna like, make nola fans so angry because of that rivalry i know that well, that's the thing it always used to be that uh nola you know always could secure the win over toronto and then that duck came to an end in uh earlier this season and now it's just a continuation so maybe they're hoping that come uh, 2023, they will finally be able to get the win over Atlanta that they've been waiting for for so long. Um, yeah, it's you not know. even that though. It's just like the general sports rivalry between NOLA and uh, New Orleans and Atlanta. It's just yeah, I suppose so. There's there's some added there's some added hate there, at least from the fan base point of view. Yeah, I suppose so. I right, move on to a Texan rivalry match for the Lone Star Championship between the three Texan teams. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't to be a close repeat of their earlier fixture this season. Houston um, were able to score a try. Dallas were able to score two penalties. And uh, then Houston were able to score again and again and again and again. And Dallas, unfortunately, just unable to get the opportunity to increase their score. Houston weren't going to leave it to the last minute to secure the victory this time. They did it right from the start. Final score, Houston 31, Dallas 6. I mean, considering all the issues that Dallas have had this season, it's not surprising. It's just it's just upsetting because you don't want to see a team go an entire season looking in such a weak position because of circumstances beyond their control. It's no, just, it's, yeah, um, it's... Yeah, it, I, it, I, it is what it is, but it's it's not really it, like it's thing. it's crazy though. Like just, I mean, you can do all you can too to set your team up for success. Nobody's predicting that walkway accident to happen. I have no idea. No plan for that. Like that that's brutal. Um, you know. So, but because of that too, like you're bringing in a whole bunch of new players into your squad midway through the season. You know, to to attempt to. Uh, you know, just to a, attempt to put a, put the squad together after that accident too. And it's, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing for, uh, for Dallas to have to deal with. And, you know, especially in their first year, um, I think, I think that they got to break out those uh, the heritage jerseys for a, for a game though. I don't think they've worn those yet. Um, that, I mean, maybe, no, maybe but they, they do have that. I think they do have four games left at home, and one of yeah. them is Heritage Jersey Day. Oh, there we go. Be. There we go. Well, speaking of, speaking of that too, um, we didn't we didn't really touch this. Uh, Old Glory DC's got those uh, the new Cherry Blossom jerseys that also look pretty sweet. So um, maybe that maybe that's the secret to success. Yeah, that... so let's try new kits. All right, all right. I, I agree with that. I think uh, yeah. you know, Mix you got, you got, uh, yeah. when you're zero and nine, you got to try something new, so, see if it works. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll wear my jackals hat for an episode if they win a game. I think I'll yeah, I'll, I think I'll that's... rock that. That's fair. I, I think that's, that's a fair. That's not really a big a big wagery bet thing on my uh, my part. I just want to. I got a I got a green and black shirt on today for so I mean maybe that's helpful. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, I just 
I mean, everything that they've kind of been through, it'd be nice to see the Jackals pick up a W um, yeah. during this season. But um, yeah, the, the roster is obviously just depleted at this point, though. Yeah, which it's, is yeah, super, it's, super unfortunate. It's, but and and you have to also keep in mind that the guy that was supposed to be their head coach due to visa issues um, never came over, and there hasn't been yeah. a. There hasn't been an official head coach placed in. I mean, Elaine yeah, Vassie. It's Elaine, uh, it's Elaine Vassie just running. Yeah, she, she, she's just up. running it. She's doing like multiple yeah. roles at the moment. And it may be a case of it's, you know, cutting losses. It's, yeah, it's, it's tough. To, it's just tough to deal with. But, it, and know. just maybe um, putting your resources forward to like 2023 and, you know, going yeah. that way. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're not we're not part of any of the MLR management teams, but uh, you know when when there's so much that's going on beyond your control, it's f- important to focus on what you can do and see where you go from there. All right, the next match, which was uh, another Western clash, which was San Diego versus Austin. Austin were coming out of their bye week. San Diego at home. Uh, this again seemed to be a very close match, and then Austin were just able to pull away right at the end, securing the try bonus point as well to give them a bonus point win. You know, they're definitely focusing on the playoff race. They're saying that they want to have the um, home playoff, uh, sorry, home uh, championship match for the Western Conference. They are currently four points ahead of their cocktail cousins, the LA Guiltinis, Mm -hmm. and uh, they'll be intending to keep that distance at uh, four and hopefully increasing it as the season goes on. And, you know, it's uh, especially uh, poignant considering that Austin finished third last season, you know, just missing out on the reduced uh, playoff race. But, you know, they were able to string it together again. Um, You know, they uh, scored uh, one try in the first half and then Roach was able to score two tries within the space of eight minutes and then Matina able to score just before the end to ensure that bonus point. Um, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say my uh, my pick of San Diego beating Austin was looking really good after the first half, and then um, you know I, I don't know, man. We got a Sam Harris, apparently the king of halftime speeches in this league. I guess he uh, yeah, he, well, couple, man knows what he's doing. Yeah, so this is a couple games uh, games in a row now. It seems that uh, Austin's second half Austin kind of seems to be a little bit of a different animal to deal with right now. So, um, but uh, yeah, like San Diego too, though. Um, obviously, rocking uh, one of the bigger Canadian contingents in the league. Um, I thought Smith Smith played played well again. I think he's been having a great season over there. Um, Augsburger's injury last week definitely opening a door for Jason Higgins. Um, you know, with a start this week. And, you know, I thought, I thought it handled, handled himself mm-hmm. um, pretty well throughout the game, especially in the first half, um, you know, as uh, San Diego was, uh, you know, their, their offense was kind of clicking a lot in the first half. They definitely had the bulk of the possession as well. And um, they, it's funny, like the first half just doesn't look like the second half at all as Austin began to pull away. Um, interestingly, though, too, Pat Lynott, Hooker, that's new. Yeah, that was. I think that's that was new. new to him as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I mean, that's uh in, in that uh the the reserves first row there. You had a uh, Joe Walsh at a uh, loose head, Pat uh, Chris Bauman at um, tight head, and uh, yeah, Pat Lynott Hooker. There we go. So that's uh that's something new. Um, mm-hmm. Nice to see uh, you know the Canadian guys uh, you know expanding their uh, their reach there. My other my other really fun thing from this game. Um, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the Canadian, but Patty Ryan rocking number 24, just for my weird uniform nerd in me is like, I, I, I love the random, the random numbers that show up sometimes. So 20 shout out to Patty Ryan, the great yeah. number 24 iconic Jersey number of Patty Ryan. Though. And now we move on to the game of the round, which was for the Champagne Cup, Los Angeles versus New York. So uh, I don't know if you remember, Derek, but in uh, 2021, New York were the first team to beat L.A. in Major League Rugby. 
And yes. for the past year, LA have made it their job to ensure that no one ever remembers that game again. <laughs> and I think well, clearly been it's wrong team. because you just brought it up. So they still have work to do. So, yeah. So this, uh, this was a return uh, to 2021 LA. So, you know, everything was just working for them, you know, behind the back, no look passes just for fun. New York, all out of sorts. Um, before we get into the scoring, um, something we have to mention is Andrew Coe's injury. Um, Coe uh, slipped on the grass, and unfortunately, as he went down, his head connected with a LA player's knee and was out cold. Uh, fortunately, the medical staff were there at pitch side, able to assist as soon as possible. Uh, stretcher was brought on, and you know, Coe was taken away, his pace, uh, played some neck brace to ensure everything was okay. And, uh, and Alex Corbiziero was on uh, the commentary team and he informed the viewers at home that Andrew Coe has been responsive and been talking to the medical staff. So uh, very unfortunate injury for Coe. It was a case of that no one's to blame for that. And we hope he can recover as soon as possible and as safely as possible as well yeah that's definitely definitely a scary situation to see him go down like that it was definitely a tough one to watch hopefully he's okay and um is able to to get back on the pitch um, in a timely fashion but yeah but now let's turn to the actual scoring in this game and who boy so we would talk about uh new york scoring but uh they didn't so we will move on to la and yeah, completely one side. Uh, Poitavin getting the first try uh, within 12 minutes. Uh, Hanko Gurmishes scoring in the 26th. Um, Harrison Goddard in the 34th. And then uh, Canadian uh, front rower Justice Sears Duru scoring in the 35th minute. I mean, I saw Goddard's try and was waiting, like, oh, this is going to be you know, another play, and then it'll probably, like, see out the half, and so on and so forth. Literally a minute later, Sears Duru was over the line and securing the bonus point try. It was unbelievable. It was, New York's defense was so porous, it was, may as well have been a sieve. It was... <laughs> That, yeah. uh, just letting everything through, players out of position, players in the wrong spot. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, now to be fair, New York did lose uh, Will Tucker earlier early on in the game and uh, was replaced by Joe yeah. Bassa. But New York was... definitely had some injury issues in this uh, yeah. injury issues in this game. Um, so that uh, Sears Duru try too also started by a sweet uh, sweet play from Ben Lesage, little line break, little nice mm -hmm. little offload. Um, yeah, and I think Lasage had, had a fantastic game. Yeah, uh, and then you had Ryberg too. Added, uh, yeah. added the last two tries in the second half. Yeah, um, and then it it did look as though that New York were pushing and were on the verge of potentially getting a like consolation try, yeah. but hey. unfortunately they just got. They should have had a try in the first half to like. They they, they should have. Well, and, it's like. So yes. Sears Duru gets a yellow card yeah. for collapsing the scrum on the second scrum. Yeah. So like, and it's like you can't. New York can't choose scrum again. Yeah, that it's was... like your option there is you could like you could pick a scrum versus seven guys, and yeah. have to bring in you have to or I guess you would have to have to well probably wouldn't be against seven guys because you probably bring in, uh, you probably send a back off to bring a prop in, but like. You know what I mean? Like you have another opportunity, like because the, if, if there's one thing that New York definitely did better in LA in this game, it was the scrum, um, yeah. right? Like, yeah, uh, like New York scrum was definitely definitely better than LA's in this game, and it's just it, it is one of those situations where like looking at like how close they are to the line, seeing that like you know LA's given up a yellow card for collapsing scrums, and then and then New York's not able to take advantage of that. They have to go for a line out, and they. And it, it doesn't connect for them, right? Um, the, this rule stinks. <laughs> it, uh, it it needs it needs to go. Yeah. Next year, and all on it, it just it needs to go. Um, it, it needs to be replaced like a three strikes and you're out. 
system. Not even. No, it just needs. It just. It needs to to just be the normal rule. No, I I think it should be three strikes and out because I can understand how, wanting to keep the game flowing. Yeah. And like that, but when you are within like five meters, and That's... because normally it would be if you have uh, try uh, try not tries, um, if you have the scrum reset uh, three times and it's then a penalty, it's also usually a penalty try as well. Yeah, that's the normal rule, though. Exactly, but that's the thing, like, you can do best of three. Anyway, that's a future conversation for MLR to have, and we can move on. I was going to say, at the very least, it has to be a penalty resets the count. Like, if you you get a penalty, if you win a penalty, you should be able to call for a scrum again. At the very least, the rule needs to be modified to that. Well, that can be. Uh, it can. This can all be addressed at a later day by MLR higher ups who decide all these things instead of just two guys on a podcast. Yeah, but if we complain, right? We so, oh my god, let it go. Um, okay, so now, now we've talked about like North American uh, rugby much in the 15s game. We are now heading over to Singapore for the seventh, and uh, didn't go well. The, I was going to say, can we just team. skip to the part where, Nagog, uh, where Nagogno scores the greatest try in the history of rugby? We can in a minute, but we have to explain like how we got there in that situation. So uh, the pool was obviously a very difficult pool, to say the least. It included South Africa, the USA, Kenya. Um, South Af- the game against South Africa was uh, 31-5 to to the blitz box. Um, against Kenya is 24 to 7. And then we come to the most amazing sevens try ever um, between the USA and Canada. So it's 33 to, I believe, 5. And we are in the final seconds. Clock has gone red. And then we have uh, Kevin Williams getting the ball. He need, all he needs to do is kick it out. Game's over. Uh, he kicks it um, behind him, and he hits the posts, uh, the uprights, bounces <laughs> off into open area, where Ngongo picks the ball up and scores a try. And um, in all fairness to Kevin Williams, he's he's been on Twitter saying, you know, all this pitch and I had to hit the post, you know, one of the most embarrassing moments in USA rugby history. You know, he's taking it in his stride. The, U- the USA, I'll admit, had a... Pretty good game. They, I think they finished fifth yeah. or sixth. In they beat the, South Africa during uh, Singapore. Yeah, so they finished top of top of the pool that yeah. uh, Canada was in, and yeah, they had uh, some pretty good games. Um, I uh, got to mention also that Lockie Kratz, uh, Noel the goal of fame, um, also put in a phenomenal try in the corner against Kenya, and uh, one against England too. And yeah, Deshaun Bowen. Um, you know, dodging everyone to score against England in a game that they would fortunately lose. And whilst there is no uh, game for the uh, 15th place playoff uh, on <laughs> score difference alone, it is Canada were the bottom of the pile. And, you know, it as we've seen from the performance review, it looks like it's going to be a difficult time ahead for both sevens teams. But at least next week we'll be able to enjoy it and a more reasonable hour because they will be held in Vancouver. Where in fact, we're going to make the post bigger for Williams or smaller for Williams, just in case more visible for him. What are we going to do? How do we uh, help? We're, do we help we're not going to do anything. We're just going to watch <laughs> the game. So I don't know what you're on about sabotaging yeah. other teams. What's, what's the matter? Oh, with I was going to say, yeah, uh, we should, yeah, Goodness. we should paint like a target on the, like, on the, on the post just for him or something. But yeah, um, that is, the, that is one of the greatest tries I have ever seen. I just, yeah. It's hilarious. Um, I do kind of, I'll, I'll, I do kind of feel for Williams because I feel like um, when I think when I was like 16, 17, playing hockey, we had a uh, a scenario where I think there was like five or six seconds left in a period with a uh, defensive zone face off, and I I played defense, and the centerman won the puck back into the corner and i was just like i'm just gonna rifle this around the glass kill the clock into the period so i go to 
just clear out, like kind of shoot the puck around the boards behind the net. And the puck got up a little too high, hit the stanchion on the glass, shot out, hit our goalie in the back of the head and went in the net. Derek. <laughs> Which I feel like is probably how Kayvon Williams feels after that. Um, which was a mix of like, I maybe I shouldn't have kicked the ball slash shot the puck in that direction, but also what are the actual odds of this happening? Yeah. And oh, well, he lives, he laughed about it, and I'm sure he'll uh, be in a better position when he comes to the uh, sevens in Vancouver. Now, speaking of which, uh, we actually mentioned that game will be in Vancouver, but if you're in Canada and you are wanting to watch the sevens as they take place this coming weekend, you can find them on CBC and CBC Gem. Uh, If you want to watch more 15s action, uh, the Champions and Challenge Cup is having their second round of the round of 16, and you can watch that on epcrugby.tv. There is a break in the Women's Six Nations, so that won't be on this weekend. But if you're looking for some Super Rugby Pacific, you can find that on TSN. If you want to watch Japan League One, you can find that on the Rugby Network, as well as the other non-Arrows games. And if you are looking for the Arrows versus NOLA game, which will be held this day at midday, and you're not in the GTA region, you can watch that on TSN. So, Derek, we have come to round 11, and it is time to make our predictions. First up, DC versus Utah. Who do you have? Uh, man, I think this, this, one, this one might be a little bit tighter. Uh, it's a fun one. I know. You, are, you, are you going with DC, like you said earlier in the, in the show? I'm a man of my word. I think that Utah will be coming off a bye week with a new coaching staff, and I think there will still be some – uh, teething pains to come from that. I think DC will now have had Nate Osborne for two weeks. They've had two consecutive games where they've been able to not only get the try bonus point, but within losing bonus point difference. I think third time's a charm. I think this is the game that's going to get them over the line. All right. So if you're going to take DC, I'll take Utah then. All right. Derek with Utah, and I will have DC. Also, I'm just noticing too that the Tooney is 29 and 29. It is exactly okay. down the middle. I was going to, which feels we're like we're both doing better than it. I know we're both doing better than it, but I'm like, I'm actually like, I guess that that feels right for what a coin flip should be able to accomplish, right? It should be 50 50. Like, yeah, I suppose so. Get half of them, uh, I guess. Okay. Also makes, Next. So if anybody's below 500, they'll just know that you're worse than a Tooney. Next up, we have Toronto versus Nola. I will be picking Toronto. Derek, will you be doing the same? Yep. Then fantastic. Up next, we have Seattle versus San Diego. Derek, who are you going with? Oh, I think I'm I'm gonna go with San Diego. So I just think they're you know tough second half against Austin, but I think overall they've just they've been playing better this year. So I think overall San Diego have um had a good run. Uh we are now we're now in the business end, and I think Seattle, especially against a team as strong as New England, they push them really close. And also Seattle are at home, so I'm going to go with Seattle. Up next, we have LA versus Houston. So the reverse of the opening shock fixture where Houston beat LA. Do you think Houston can do it again? No. So you're going with LA? Yep. Not in LA. Not with them getting injuries and stuff back too. Also, yeah, Houston wasn't that great in that game. Like I know, I know they beat LA, but Houston was not that great in that game either. Yeah, I think just a L- bad game for everybody involved. I think LA have been uh, getting back into form now that uh, guys have been coming from injury and they have more depth uh, to pick from. So I will be going with LA as well. And the final game of the. And it is another game in the Lone Star Champs series. It is between Dallas and Austin. And yeah, it's going to be in Dallas, but, uh, you know, we've already mentioned it enough times. I don't think Dallas have it in them. I think that they are just holding on by threads at this point. I'm going to go with Austin. 
I enjoy chaos and also beating you. And we matched way too many teams last week. So let's go, Jack. That, that was last week, and we got yeah. like we the were, same. We were result. right. We were right on all of them. We were right on all of them. Yeah. Um, ex- yeah, we got five and one. Five we both and got one. five, yeah, five and good. one. So, um, yeah. You want to go with Dallas? No, yeah, no. We'll go with Dallas. We'll go. I, I don't, uh, don't, don't, don't let me down though, Dallas. I, I think they, they got to get a win. This is, uh, you know, the, the saying, it's a, it feels like a trap game for Austin. It's a game. They're probably going to rest some guys or whatever. And that might be a bad idea. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, you've heard my picks. You've heard Derek's picks. And now if you want to find out the Toonies picks, you can find that out exclusively on our TikTok channel. That's tiktok.com at LaRouge Rugby. And in fact, if you want to find us across social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, you can find us at LaRouge Rugby. If you enjoyed listening to this episode of the podcast, you can listen to more on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Anchor FM. And if you want to enjoy watching our beautiful faces, you can find more episodes at our YouTube channel, again, at La Rouge Rugby. Derek, if people want to find you on social media, where can they do so? Uh, at Percept the Jet across all social media platforms. And you can find me, mainly on Twitter and Instagram, at Hardman, spelled H-4-R-D-M-A-N. Well, Derek, thank you for joining me, and thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast. I hope you can join us again next time.